Right, hi everybody. Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. We're also excited to announce that all of our previous and upcoming recorded webinars now have Spanish subtitles, so please help us spread the word. This is the 16th webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these months of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, and by now you know that that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're introducing you to Beth Russell and Hilary Petticord with NOAA's Earth System Research Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. While we'll be talking about how NOAA shares data and information in Boulder, we want to recognize that these are the traditional territories of the regional Native Americans who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We recognize that the NOAA Boulder Laboratories sit upon land within the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. Further, there are 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We'd also like to acknowledge that we are hosting this webinar from the land of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe and the Wampanoag Tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and want to make sure everyone can hear them. However, there's a box where you can write questions. You you know what to do, ask them as we go, and I will keep track for Beth and Hillary, and we'll pause periodically to get those questions answered. We may not get to all of them, but we'll try to do as many as we can. All right, so with no further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you ladies. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, so as Nicole said, I am Beth, and I'm here with Hillary. Um, and we both, uh, as she said, work at NOAA's Earth System Research Laboratory. Um, and so we're supposed to start a little bit with how we've ended up at NOAA. Um, so for me, I um, studied meteorology in school because I have always loved snow. So here's a picture of me as a little kiddo. I grew up in Delaware. Um, so that's me in my front yard hanging out um, after a big snowstorm and I've always loved snow. And so as a kid, I wanted to be able to forecast when it was going to snow. And so becoming a meteorologist seems like the obvious path for me. So I went to Penn State, um, which has a great meteorology program. And then I ended up interning in college with uh, Science on a Sphere actually, which is where I work now. And then after college, they offered me a job. So I have worked at NOAA my entire uh, career with science on the sphere. So how about you, Hillary? Yeah, I have a, a very flattering photo here to show you um, that I grew up in Wyoming, where there was also a lot of snow. I am as big a fan of snow as, um, as I think anyone can get. Um, but I didn't have a very linear path to NOAA. So I actually went to school at the University of Wyoming and didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I moved to New York City and traveled the world. And as you can see, I was a big fan of skiing. Um, so I went and was a ski bum for a while until I read Colorado. And that's when I decided I wanted to go back to school to be a science teacher. So that's when um, I got basically climate and weather and earth science really filled up my heart. And um, I ended up getting a job with NOAA and I've also been at NOAA for a decade um, this June. So we have some staying power in our group here. Absolutely, we love science on a sphere. So for those of you who don't know what science on a sphere is, it's a six foot animated globe that's installed in science museums around the world. And you all should check, um, once museums open up again, um, check your local science museum. Chances are they might have a science on a sphere. 
If they don't, you should tell them to get one. Um, but we can show all different kinds of content. Um, since we're NOAA, we focus on oceans and atmosphere, um, but we can do all sorts of different things with science on the sphere. But because everyone can't get to the Science Museum, we came up with Explorer. Yeah, so this was a huge thing for me because I work with teachers a lot and students, and I really wanted people to be able to see our content outside of the Science Museum. So we really put a lot of effort into making a flat screen or a virtual sphere version of our product called SOS Explorer, which you can also sometimes see in museums. But recently, we decided to actually take that for free and put it on your mobile device. So hopefully you have downloaded it um, today. And if not, um, certainly after this webinar, you can put it on your phone or your iPad or your, um, your Android device and go through all the data sets that we showed you here today. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got it on my phone here so I can follow along, but we're of course going to be showing you um, a little bit of it on the through the webinar as well. So our plan for today, we decided was Earth Systems. It's kind of a way to jump off of um, Earth Day and keep celebrating Earth Day and all the wonderful things about Earth that make it the place where we can live and where there is the only place that we have with life. Uh, so we're gonna go through each of these systems and how they interact a little bit. Um, atmosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere, lithosphere, and biosphere. And if you're curious what those mean, we're gonna go through that um, as well. So we're gonna flip right over into SOS Explorer. That is right. And so we're starting with the atmosphere. So being a meteorologist, this I think is my favorite of the spheres. Um, I don't know, Hillary, if you have a favorite sphere, but I think I like our atmosphere the best. So you need all the spheres. That's the beauty of the Earth system. All five spheres interacting together is what makes our planet so special. Yeah, and when you open up your app, the first thing that you see is actually clouds, real-time clouds, exactly where they are um, the last time you opened your app. So when I opened this this morning, this is where the clouds are. Um, it's also real-time day-night lighting, so we can um, see where it's dark right now and see where the where the sunrise is coming around. Um, so that is something I wanted to point out before we get into the atmosphere. So the atmosphere, by the way, is this thin layer of gases that separate Earth from space. And then the lowest level of the atmosphere is where we live, um, but it's also where all the weather happens. That is right, yeah. And so uh, what we're looking at here is just a loop um, from 2019 from two of NOAA's geostationary satellites. So these are satellites way up in space um, that are rotating at the same rate the Earth is rotating. So they're always over the same part of the world. Um, since they're the NOAA satellites, we wanna make sure the United States is within view so that we can see what's going on in our home. Uh, and you'll see the day, night, uh, line, the day-night terminator is what it's called, that line between day and night, um, as it moves across. Um, and this is giving us a really high resolution view of um, the clouds and everything uh, that is going on. Um, so it's a pretty fabulous view of our Earth. Now, one thing that we want you to notice is the direction the clouds are moving. Um, so in some areas, the clouds are moving west to east, and in other areas, they're moving east to west. Now, this has to do with the rotation of the Earth um, and also the latitude of where they are on Earth. So it's important to know that everything's not moving in the exact same uniform way. We live in a really complex Earth system. In general, for where the United States is, we're going to have movement from west to east. 
So you can see um, right now there's clouds starting to enter. Well, we started the loop again, but typically we're going to move, clouds will move from California to Delaware um, across the United States from west to east. Yeah, so those of you who are in the east, I'm sure that you have figured out when you see some crazy headlines of snow in the Rockies or snow across the Midwest, that system is often moving towards you. So you have some uh, some warning by seeing that we're digging ourselves out first. So yeah. that is the way the clouds move here. Now we're gonna move into some, uh, some severe weather is what we call it. Yes, so we are going to take a look at the 2017 hurricane season because clouds are interesting. But if we're gonna look back at historical clouds, let's see some action. So 2017 was a, a busy hurricane uh, season. You might remember Irma, Jose, Harvey, Maria. It was a big, big season. Now, an interesting thing about hurricanes is they tend to start or they can start as thunderstorms off the coast of Africa. And then they come out over the ocean and hurricanes need lots of water, warm water to grow and thrive. So they cross the Atlantic where there's plenty of water and they evaporate lots of water into their systems. They travel east to west across the Atlantic towards the United States and into the Caribbean. And we end up with hurricanes coming towards um, the United States. Now, hurricane season starts June 1st, officially. We can get hurricanes before that, but June to November is our hurricane season. And that's because that's when the oceans are warmest. So here we are, there's a nice big hurricane. And look at this, another one is coming right behind it. 2017, we had a lot of storms, one after the other, really not giving people um, a break at all. So is this Harvey that we're looking at, Hillary? This is Irma. Oh, um, Irma. Harvey actually was, I believe, uh, towards the end of August. Let's see if we can find Harvey here. Um, yeah, I forgot to look up the date of Harvey because I was going to show the ones that were training there. Um, yes, Harvey, by the other. way, there are some folks on the line from Texas, and so I'm sure if you're of a certain age, you probably remember Harvey. Um, but yeah, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to September and show Irma and Jose and Maria. So uh, Irma, which is actually the one we're watching right now across the Atlantic Ocean, was the strongest hurricane ever recorded in the Atlantic until two years later when Dorian surpassed it. So yeah. these are some pretty incredibly strong storms. Now, one question we were going to ask you, because we're ready to ask the question, and get you involved and we'll just start with a true false question first um hurricanes can happen anywhere in the world hurricanes or or tropical storms like hurricanes can happen anywhere in the world true or false okay um let's see james says true but then we've got a lot of falses isabella and connor and robert um jennifer Oh, no, James changed his answer. He thinks, so. and now Kyle and Noah and Steven all think it's true. So we've got, we got a little, a little division. Aurora says true. Duncan says true. Nina says false. What are you, are you guys going to teach us about this? Because I think we're divided. Okay, so if you remember, I said that we need warm waters in order for hurricanes to form. So the answer is false. We cannot get hurricanes everywhere. Um, one, they can only occur over the oceans. So we're not going to get a hurricane in the middle of Africa. But then also we're not going to get a hurricane, say in the oceans around Alaska, that water's too cold, or the oceans around Antarctica. 
the water's too cold, the winds aren't quite right. So we, there's a specific band, um, the intertropical convergence zone, which tends to be where we're going to see our hurricanes happening. It's along the equator, it's where the waters are the warmest, and where the wind is most conducive for our hurricanes coming together. So it was a bit of a trick question. True, false questions are always a little tricky, but we're a little tricky, so you're gonna have to. <laughs> we wanna know before we move on out of the atmosphere and move on to the hydrosphere, if you have any questions for us. I turned um, the, the, uh, the sphere around to the other side because we do get tropical storms and typhoons Actually, typically typhoons are a bit stronger than hurricanes on each given year um, because there's so much warm water and there are so many people living in ocean um, surrounded islands on that side. So typhoons can be very dangerous. So, um, yes. so yeah, I just thought I would twist it around. What questions do you all have? Okay, so we've got um, a couple of questions. Um, Somebody, a few folks wanted me to let you guys know that uh, Hurricane Harvey was in the Houston area on August 25th of 2017. Um, we, they, let's see, um, when you were, before you got to hurricanes, you were talking about the atmosphere and Sloan wanted to know whether the cloud shape depends on anything. So all the different formations they were seeing, um, Sloan wanted a little more information about that. Absolutely. So the shape of your clouds can tell you a lot. Um, so for example, if you see your cloud kind of in a, a comma shape, um, that is going to be a low pressure with a cold front behind it. So if you want to pause right there, Hillary. Yeah. Let's see if we can find. So if we look out over the Atlantic Ocean here, you can see kind of a distinct line. Um, up in the Northern Atlantic off the US. Um, so when you get that big line, that's gonna be a cold front. And that's where you're gonna get your, your weather. So as this front comes through, you're gonna have storms in front of it, colder air behind it. Um, so when we see that, um, you can expect some weather. Just general clouds over a big area, that's typically not as much going on. Um, there, but any sharp lines that you see within the clouds, um, that tells you a lot. Also, these images are colorized so that you can see some areas are bright white, some are a lighter gray. The bright white are where the clouds are really thick, and the gray is where they're thinner, as you might expect. And so we're going to see more weather with the bright white clouds. The bright white means there's a lot of moisture, which means they're really tall clouds. Um, so think thunderstorm clouds, cumulonimbus, um, with lots of moisture, lots of activity going on. So yeah, you can definitely. Last one, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. The last one I just wanted to mention is if you look um, here over uh south america in, in mm -hmm. this um kind of jungly region do you see how the clouds kind of burst and then they dissipate and then they burst and then they dissipate this is what you get during your sort of summer rainstorms so i think probably most of you understand that at three o'clock in the afternoon perhaps on a really hot summer day you get kind of a rainstorm coming through. It doesn't happen everywhere, but certainly it happens here. And I know in Texas and a lot of um, places that are near mountains and such. So just wanted to point that out too, because those are more sort of summer-like features. Yep. Great, thank you. So we have another question um, for about that. I think a few folks are trying to use the app um, and so they were asking if you could, can you sort of um, go back a step just so they can see how to access the data sets or the, you know, what they would need to do to be looking at the same thing that you're displaying here? Oh, yeah, yeah. we should be showing you the titles of our data sets as we load them up for Certainly. sure. So start uh, here with, um, with a, a drawer that opens on the left and it has a green arrow. Um, so you start with just the blue marble with real-time clouds and real-time day-night lighting. And then if you press the green button on the left, 
the first thing we started with was actually earth in true color. Um, I believe we called it goes 16 and 17. So earth in true color is yes. basically the best view of our earth from our latest and greatest satellite that NOAA has put up in the last few years. Okay. And, and secondly, we chose hurricane season 2017. So Did you, you might see a couple data sets in there that aren't available in the app because I'm using the desktop version because it's a little more stable. Right, and, and if you pulled those data sets up again, did you have to select air in order to get access to these data sets or is that category pulled down? The category just shortens my amount of choices. I see. But okay. no, you can go ahead and just scroll through and find hurricanes, no matter whether or not you have the category open. But if you have category, for example, people, you might not see um, earth and true color, for example. Okay, great. Um, a few questions you talked, you were talking about hurricanes. Um, does the data set tell you how many hurricanes were visible in this year? It doesn't, no. So you would have to watch it and count. The hurricanes are, are pretty easy to see. You get that nice circular shape in the eye uh, in the middle, but um, our website where we have descriptions of the data sets, I believe has a count for the number of um, hurricanes, but they're not labeled in the app for you. Got it, okay. Do you guys happen to know, um, can hurricanes go to Iceland? Lillian wants to know. All the way to so Iceland. There have actually been some hurricanes that have dissipated over um, Ireland and given Ireland a big blast of weather, um, but it was considered an extra tropical storm. So anytime you get kind of outside the tropical region, which tends to be between 23 and a half degrees north and 23 and a half degrees south or 30 degrees, for example, the clouds start to move in the east, in the eastern, uh, westerly direction again. So from east to west and you get outside of that warm water area. So you're gonna call those extra tropical storms. And so, yeah, Iceland could certainly get some storming after a hurricane, but it wouldn't be considered a hurricane. A hurricane. Now, one thing you guys can do is in the app, you can look for hurricane tracks cumulative 1950 to 2005. And what that's going to show you is all of the tracks of hurricanes through that 55 year period. So Hillary's loaded up here for us. And so this shows you very clearly that hurricanes don't happen everywhere, but they do cover pretty big areas. And so if we look at Iceland, there has been a little tail of one crossing over there. Um, so there you go, that's your answer. Very cool. Uh, that's some very nice real-time problem solving there. I appreciate it. Um, now, we are we do have a question about the biosphere, but I'm going to hold off on that because I think you guys are going to get to that. Um, okay. And one other question about the atmosphere when you were showing it, um, Stephen wanted to know whether those were gases, whether we're seeing gases in the atmosphere shots. Yeah, so what the, the shots that we were looking at are all looking at uh, water. So tip water vapor, um, water droplets, clouds, so it would be the water droplets. Um, but where it's super thin, it kind of looks like a gas, but that's water that has evaporated into the air and then condensed into cloud droplets and rain droplets. So that's what we're looking at there. But we certainly do have satellites that can measure various gases that are in our atmosphere. Okay, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, so, and Stephen's very impressed by that. He said, wow. Um, so the, the, the tracks that you had just showed, um, it, did those tell you what type of, like what category hurricane um, those, those are? Okay. Oh, there yeah, it is so on, the, on, the, on the left there, okay. 
Yeah, so an important thing. And one of the things we like about SOS Explorer is helping people um, dig into visualizations and figure out what's going on. So always checking for the color bar. And actually, Hillary, if you want to load up sea surface temperature, let's do a lesson and checking for the color bar here. Yeah, that was going to be our question. And we were going to start right off with a question in the next data set because uh, it's important while, oh, I don't know that this has the right one actually. Um, oh, our so text is black, so you can't read it. Yeah, it's text is black. That's funny. Um, I don't think it's incorrect on your app. Sorry about that. Um, so our first question, actually, when we moved to the sea surface temperature model, was what is the color or where is the warmest water. So I'm going to ask what's the color because we screwed up and didn't give you the numbers on the color bar. Um, so what is what is the color do you think of the warmest water on earth? Oh everybody's getting this one right. Everybody's Sloan and Raven, Connor, Isabella, Stephen, Grace, James, they all say red. Yeah, Excellent. That not a trick question. <laughs> Go ahead, Beth. Oh, so, yep, you all are exactly right. Dark red is where we're going to see our uh, warmest temperatures. Um, and we tend to see this along the equator because that's where we're going to get the most direct sunlight. So the Earth's tilted, so part of the year, part of the globe's not getting as much sunlight, and, but the equator gets a lot of sunlight year round. So it tends to be the warmest. So Hillary, I'm gonna ask you a question. Um, what role does the ocean play? Why is the hydrosphere important? Yes, so my favorite data set to, to um, talk about that would actually be the sea surface currents data set, if that's okay. Yes. Um, so this is actually a data set that we use to describe the movement of the ocean on the very top, um, the very shallowest part of the ocean. And um, so what Beth was asking me is what does it play? What role does the ocean play? It is an incredibly important um, part of our uh, Earth system. So it's kind of like your heart pump, pumping blood and oxygenating your body. So pumping blood around your, um, around your body all the way from your head to your toes, keeping everything in line and exchanging gases. Um, so that it's very similar in the sense that it's kind of your circulatory system. So it takes warm water and oxygenated water and it exchanges gases with the atmosphere. So I will um, just kind of concentrate on one of those uh, at the moment. So if you look here at Africa, we can see the, the sea surface currents moving right across the equator there and then kind of moving up along South America and sort of doing this real curly stuff around the Caribbean um, and then moving up along the east coast of the United States but it doesn't stop there it moves into these places that are actually very cold so it's bringing warm water to places that don't get as much heat and so because of that we have a lot of people that live in places like Scandinavia. Um, we have a lot of people that live in Ireland and the United Kingdom. But we certainly have fewer people that live in northeastern uh, Canada and fewer people that live in Greenland because you don't get that warm current um, moving directly to those places. So you're basically distributing heat and also regulating gases such. So then the question for our students would be, what would the temperature on earth be like if we didn't have the oceans? 
Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Isabella says it would be cold. Um, and, and Robert agrees. I, while we're waiting for people to put their answers in, I can tell you, Raven came up with a really good um, observation. She said this one remind, looks like the Earth's fingerprint when you first mm -hmm. pulled it up. Um, that was pretty cool, Raven. Um, so a, a lot of people say very cold. Some people say more extreme in both directions, depending on location. Um, and yeah, Lillian says cold or um, yeah, a lot of people think that that's what would happen. Yeah, so probably the more extreme was a little bit better of an answer, but um, you're correct. I think there would certainly be, it would be more cold in general because we would have more ice at the poles, which would make our planet colder. Um, but we also would have more extremes. So the center of the planet would be hotter um, and the anywhere above probably 45 degrees latitude would be very cold. Um, so this ocean action really makes places more habitable. And you don't get as much of that in Antarctica because you don't have as much pinballing around these different land masses and you kind of get this cold buffer around Antarctica, which is why it's so cold and icy and it doesn't have any yeah, Antarctica there. is the coldest place on earth. And it's because like Hillary was saying, it's completely isolated. Look at those cold, cold currents circling Antarctica. Whereas if we look at the North Pole, it's actually an ocean surrounded by land. So there's a lot going on up there. And currents wise, you don't see as much because a lot of that is frozen or uh, in the winter anyway. Um, and so our poles are opposite. One is land surrounded by ocean and the other is ocean surrounded by land. Which makes a big difference for the atmosphere, by the way. If you don't get mixing and you don't get these kind of layers um, where the, the earth is, I'm sorry, the continents are impacting the way things move. Um, so it really makes a big difference that Antarctica has a bunch of ocean around one piece of land. Can you also, show, well, I'm sorry, while you were just showing that, can you also show the hottest places based on those currents? I think you showed it briefly on the equator, but. Yeah. For sure. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to show that. That would you think it would be surface temperature, or do you think current? Um, let's let's stick with oceans, I guess, and go back to the model that we started with originally. Okay. Good, because that'll allow me to ask one other question that we got. Um, okay. So. Oh, go ahead, Nicole. Um, so yeah, so that was the, the, the first question was, does, where are the hottest places on earth? Yeah, so your the hottest places on earth are closer to the middle of a continent and close to the equator. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason for that is that you get, you get essentially really hot weather when you get that direct sunlight constantly, like at the equator. So you have to be in the tropics. Um, but then the, the further you get away from the ocean, the less of that cooling ocean air and the ocean actually takes a long time to warm up. So um, it actually regulates temperature and makes it cooler if you live right near the ocean. So probably some of the hottest places in the world are along the equator deserts. in Africa. Yep. And in some of the deserts where it's, there's not vegetation to help absorb some of that and cause evaporation, there's, yeah, gonna be really, really hot. And then some of our warmest oceans are probably, what would you say, the Southeast Pacific? Um, that's where we get some of our worst hurricanes. So that's a good indicator of ocean temperatures. Yeah. 
And so, so this area we're looking at right in there, look at those dark reds that you're seeing. That's telling you temperatures are really warm in those areas. Yeah, and so some, then the other question we had about this one was from Robert about the green line. So oh. um, maybe you can talk about that. Along the equator here? Yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. actually, I was gonna say something about that and I expected someone to ask that question. Um, yeah, so we were telling you guys that the equator is the hottest area, the hottest part of the ocean. But then we get this like kind of cool water getting infused and you can kind of see these little wave-like patterns. Um, so that is, um, that has everything to do with a similar to El Nino pattern where you basically get wind pushing surface water and then eventually that that wind is causing it's causing the bottom of the ocean to turn up so this is called upwelling so basically the upwelling is happening next to i'm going to pause it right there next to south america so you get these strong winds pushing towards australia and then you get this um ocean upwelling that's coming up near South America, and then it's on top of the ocean, and then it gets pushed across. I hope that made sense. Yeah, so cold, deep ocean water comes to the surface along South America, and then the wind drives it out across the ocean. So ocean circulation, ocean currents um, are responsible for mixing, and so we see that happening right there along the equator. Yeah, just to salt. You probably would have wow. uh, oceans would be similar. Okay, you might need to repeat that, Hillary. We lost you momentarily. Yeah, I got a little bubble about that. <laughs> <laughs> you might you might imagine that the salt in the oceans is consistent that all the oceans are mostly the same amount of salt um, or salinity is what we call that, but it's not actually the case. So here's, here's a better color bar. Um, how many practical salinity units is, gosh, Beth, maybe I don't wanna ask that. Do you have a better question? Let's see. So, how about this? Why do you think different areas of the ocean have different levels of saltiness? Hmm. That's a good so, question. Question. All right. So, let's see what you what do you guys think? So, while Hillary's driving us around here, we're looking at the looking at the middle of the Atlantic Ocean right now. Um, Robert thinks it might be mineral deposits. Connor and Daniel think water temperature. Um, Stephen thinks it might be the animals that live there. Um, Isabella thinks it's depth. Uh, Kyle thinks depth and temperature. Um, Sloan thinks temperature. Um, a lot of a lot of temperature guesses. Um, okay. Yeah, and. Maybe evaporation is in higher in some areas, um, and maybe where freshwater rivers are emptying, says Kayla. Um, mm -hmm. Ben thinks it might be the different plant life, you know, that exists in that part of the ocean. Yeah. Um, so lots of lots of good thoughts. We've got a really smart group on our hands here because I would say the answer is E, all of the above. Um, there's a lot of reasons why the saltiness varies in the ocean, and I think almost all of them were listed. Things like fresh water sources dumping into the ocean, like rivers and icebergs, evaporation being different based on temperature and weather. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different reasons, and you all listed most of them, I think. The most obvious one is just the closer to the equator, the more evaporation you get. Um, but it's also important that you don't have 
fresh flow. So places like the Mediterranean just don't really have a lot of fresh flow and you can't see it so well. They don't have as much data necessarily going on in this area. And I can't remember why we're lacking data in this area, but yeah, basically you're just not getting much uh, kind of fresh influx. Um, and so you're getting a lot of heat evaporation. And so that salt is just kind of concentrating. Awesome, you guys, yeah, I think we've been uh, taking our our questions to the higher level because you guys are so all right uh so should you we pause and ask if they have any questions for us let's see um we're still waiting to hear about the biosphere um but i don't have any outstanding questions that you guys haven't addressed yet that i know you're not going to get to so if you want to keep moving that's good yeah, for okay. sure so we're going to go towards the cryosphere and the cryosphere is probably what it sounds like um we're looking at sea ice concentrations um, in this particular data set, but the cryosphere is anything on Earth that is that is frozen. So that's frozen land, frozen water, frozen ocean. Um, this particular data set is actually showing just sea ice. So we're only looking at ocean water that freezes and then thaws throughout the year. So we've been able to look at this actually since 1979, the dates on this one are incorrect. Sorry, they're correct on your app, I believe. But 1979, I believe all the way to 2017 is what we have right now for this data set. And we've been able to see using microwave technology um, from satellites, measuring the amount of sea ice since 1979. So we have a really good record of this. And we can see how it expands and it shrinks. Yeah, so we're looking at the seasonal variation. So it, as you might expect, through the winter freezes and then through the summer melts. Um, and you would think, you know, summertime, like June, July, August, but it turns out that September is when we're going to get our minimum amount of sea ice in the Northern hemisphere. We have to specify, right? Because our poles are opposite. So our question for you all is, why do you think it's September, which isn't the hottest month? Why is it September? when we get the least amount of sea ice. Okay, September for the least amount of sea ice. Anybody have any ideas? While we're waiting for folks to um, put their suggestions in, can everyone see that the, the timeline in the top right is sort of showing you um, how time's changing as you look at the different ice? Okay, so folks are saying um, not cold enough. Some people honestly have no idea. They want you to tell them. <laughs> um, <laughs> melting over the summer temperature um, because the ice was melting over the summer and it isn't refreezing yet, says Robert. Well, there we go. Robert's answered our question for us. He is exactly right. So it's hot in the summer and so the ice melts all summer um and by september it's not cold yet it's getting cooler but it isn't hitting freezing yet so the ice is still melting a little bit so all that melting happens all summer long and it's not until september that it starts to get cold and we might see some refreezing again so typically mid to early september is when we're going to get our minimum amount of sea ice happening. Um, and so they track that every year so that we can compare um, sea ice from year to year to see how it's changing because that's a good indicator of global temperature. And so we can see how our global temperature is changing based on how our sea ice concentration is changing. Yeah, so a moment ago, I had only the September sea ice concentrations 
moving through time. I decided to go back to the full year because I wanted to show you guys one of the more most important things about the ice is really what it does to our climate. So um, when we're watching the sea ice expand and shrink, one of the things you probably notice is that the ocean is quite dark, especially compared to the ice, right? And so this is a huge factor in our um, climate system. So incoming rays from the sun, when they come into our system and they hit white, they actually get reflected right back to space. If those incoming solar rays come in and they are absorbed by our planet, so for example, by something dark, like the ocean, then it starts to heat our entire system and that heat is actually cycled and then eventually dissipated and we get this kind of um, interesting cycle where the more white that our planet is, the more solar radiation is reflected back to space, the less our planet takes in heat. And the less ice, and of course, if we're taking in more heat, we're going to have less ice. And so the less ice you get, the more heat is absorbed. The less ice you get, the more heat is absorbed. And it's this pretty bad feedback loop where it, it, this is how we are shrinking. Um, our Arctic sea ice by a lot more than we expected. So now I'm going to move to September only so that you can see how it's changed from 1987 all the way through. Now I'm going to quickly just um, move to 2007 because that was one of the first years where there were people kind of panicking about the amount of Arctic sea ice that, that was gone. Um, but basically, since then, there's been a humongous effort by NOAA and other wonderful um, partners in science trying to figure out why is sea ice uh, melting so rapidly and how can we kind of stop the melting, basically. Yes. And I'm noticing our time. We probably need to take a break and say, ask for any questions so we can keep um, moving on to more spheres. Yeah, well, we yeah we might want to keep moving. I'm going to hold on to questions for now, just so we can get to some of the um, land-based stuff. Certainly. Okay. Let's go quickly to um, earthquakes. So yes, our next sphere is the lithosphere or the geosphere. So this is looking at the earth, the rocks, and so what we've pulled up here are earthquakes from 2001 to 2015. And maybe you you guys are smart, so you might've already known this, but there are earthquakes happening every single day. Um, we hear about the big ones, um, but every day there's lots of little earthquakes that are happening. And so that's what we can see here. What we can also see is that these earthquakes happen along these lines. So there tends to be a very clear pattern as to where the majority of earthquakes happen, especially large earthquakes. Um, so if you have already learned about plate tectonics, you probably already know that this is where the boundaries are of these. The earth is essentially broken up into lots of pieces and those pieces kind of move around and crash around. So that's why we get these earthquakes. That is correct. Now, one of the things that earthquakes can cause if they happen under the ocean or near the coast is um, a tsunami. So what Hillary is pulling up for us here is a model of a tsunami that happened in 1700. Now, we didn't have the instruments back in 1700 to measure the strength of earthquakes, but thanks to some scientific sleuthing, um, they were able to figure out that an earthquake happened somewhere off the coast of the Pacific Northwest that caused a massive tsunami. And so what we're looking at 
is a tsunami wave spreading out across the Pacific Ocean. So we've got a question for you all about tsunamis, and that is, how fast do you think tsunami waves travel? And this is multiple choice for you. Um, you have A, as fast as a car, B, as fast as a jet plane, or C, as fast as a rocket. So again, car, jet plane, or rocket. How fast do tsunami waves travel? Okay, we've got a lot of bees, a lot of bees. Um, we've only got one car, that was Noah, um, and, uh, a, and a lot of rockets too. So, oh, and another, Juan thinks it's a car too. So we've got some disagreement here. Okay, well, the answer is B, a jet plane. So that's about 500 miles per hour. That's how fast these waves are traveling out in the open ocean. So um, a, that's fast. very, very fast. <laughs> so we were actually going to move on to Biosphere. If you guys are ready, we've got a number of data sets to talk about really the best part, right? Which is the living things on our planet. Um, so now we know Hillary's favorite. Yeah, and, and while you're pulling that up, Hillary, I wanted to mention to folks that on May 22nd, the week that we are having Hawaii presenters, um, we are going to have someone from the Pacific Tsunami Center, um, uh, and that is the anniversary of the Chilean earthquake of uh, 1960, I believe it is. So if you guys are interested in tsunamis and uh, learning more about that, make sure you put that on your calendars. Okay, I'm turning it back to you, Hillary. Yeah, so Beth likes this one for showing kind of the seasonal changes of the living ocean, but as well as the living land. But I'm gonna throw it out there that I actually like a better data set for this. And since you guys are so sophisticated, I'm gonna show you a model that's similar to our sea surface currents model but shows different types of phytoplankton in the ocean. So this is really the base of our food web, our marine food web, and the base of our carbon cycle, um, or I suppose uh, it's a huge chunk of our carbon cycle. So this is the, the little tiny plants in the ocean that are actually taking up carbon dioxide um, and making chlorophyll. And the largest ones are actually happening in the coldest water because the coldest water is the most nutrient rich water. So the big diatoms, the ones in red, are the ones that really um, take up these areas that are very cold. And you so can see the seasonal changes here as well. I was going to say, Nicole, you've been mentioning we have a biosphere question. Why don't you ask that now so we can make sure we address it? Well, I was just making sure that um, the person who asked heard the answer because I think you said it, which is it's called a biosphere because this is all the living organisms on Earth are on this on this sphere. So I think I think we answered that, right? Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Plants and animals and all things that we that we eat and a lot of things that we study. Um, all right, so you can kind of see the seasonal changes there with the lack of light um, and how you don't have much phytoplankton um, during that time. So I'm going to go next to bird migration patterns, and we're only looking at the birds in the Western Hemisphere. But this is a pretty fun data set that we got from a, a group called eBird, and it's the largest citizen science group um, in the world. And if, since you guys are all big fans of science, I definitely recommend getting involved in citizen science. So these are basically people who watch birds and then put into their computer what birds they see um, every day. And each one of these dots is a bird species. So a number of that bird species that are basically migrating. And you might think that birds migrate because of warmth, 
But if that was the case, then maybe birds would always stay where it's warm. So actually the primary reason that birds migrate is for food. Food becomes scarce if, should... if they stick around the same place all the time. Yeah? I was just gonna mention the, the background of this data set, you guys can probably guess, but it's temperature. So we're going through the year. And so you can see how areas warm up and cool down through the year. And then the birds are moving partially with the temperature, but the temperature then impacts what foods are available. So we can see them all moving back and forth through the year. And some of these birds um, have quite the migration path and are traveling pretty far. Super far. Some of them are like, I don't know, 10,000 miles or something. Would you guys, uh, that might be a good time uh, to illustrate what, because one of our students wanted to, was asking why everything is always moving on the sphere. So can you talk about how these data sets, why everything moves as you're visualizing it? I think you, you kind of mentioned it a second ago, but maybe be more explicit. So we live on a dynamic planet and everything's constantly changing. You can see it when you go outside. Clouds are moving. The position of the sun is changing through the day. So the amount of energy coming in changes. Um, but even things on other scales, right? Like the plates that make up Earth's crust are moving. They're moving very slowly. They move at the rate your fingernails grow, but they are moving. And the oceans are moving. When you look at the ocean, you can see waves on the surface, but those currents are driving. Everything's moving and it's because our planet rotates. So we have that motion. And then we're getting energy from the sun and that energy causes movement as well. So we live on a dynamic planet, which is part of why we're able to live here because there's so much activity. Hillary, would you add anything to that? Not really. I mean, we also have the plate movement because our the, the center of our planet has not cooled yet. So you have this kind of um, uh, dynamic fusion going on. So you have um, atoms um, building together to make uh, molecules that are releasing a ridiculous amount of heat. And so that um, happening in our core is also causing heat from the middle of our planet. So not only do we get heat from the sun, but we get heat from the middle of our planet too, uh, that causes all the plates to move around. So yeah, that's one of the ones that's a little bit less obvious. Uh, but that's a really cool thing that you brought up because I feel like we could have named this presentation something about movement. Constant that, movement. Yes. yes, constant movement. Nothing stays, stays um, in one place. So we haven't talked much about, well, first, well, we're losing, we're, we're, we're losing time. So I guess we will just go ahead and tell you what this is. Um, I suppose the label's on here too. Didn't think about that. Oh, I guess so too, yeah. But um, we haven't talked a ton about humans. So we are going to show you just two more data sets, and one of them is air traffic. There isn't a lot of traffic going on right now. Lots of people are staying home around the world. But on a typical day, this is what the skies would look like. Yeah, and so we can see it's not just everything on our planet that's moving, but it's people as well. And so we can see, particularly as this day-night Terminator crosses the U.S. and daytime comes to the U.S., lots and lots of activity kicking off with planes going all over the place, connecting all of our major um, cities. So the biosphere includes people as well because we are living things and we certainly have a big impact on our planet. You can see that primarily as well with nighttime light. Yep, so Hillary's going to load up our last data set for you all here. We definitely encourage you all to uh, explore the app more, look at the data sets on your own. Um, feel free to get in touch with us with questions you have. We're happy to email folks 
uh, as needed. But what we are looking at here are nighttime lights around the world. So these are all the lights that people leave on at night. And so where we have our biggest population centers, we're gonna see the biggest amount of light. Um, which, yeah, who would do that? With SOS Explorer too, is we have a, a transparency tool over here on the left. So you can actually look and say, gosh, I wonder why there are no people in that part of Africa. And I'm going to turn down the transparency or turn up the transparency of this data set. If I can get it to move. Um, apparently my fingers aren't working. And this basically is the Sahara Desert. So you can see that it's very, very dry here if we look on a normal map. But we can see that string of lights right next to the Nile River. So people like to live near water. We yeah. really appreciate you guys so much being with us today and being so jazzed about science. Wow, look at that. I love the nighttime lights data set. It's so cool. Um, yes. You guys were fantastic. You know so much about all the data that we have out there to describe the earth. And uh, we learned a lot about the, the layers too. So thank you for that. We did run a little long. So my apologies to everybody who um, was, a few folks were going, is this going past 12? <laughs> so thanks for hanging in there. Um, and let's see, on Wednesday of this week, we're talking to someone from Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant about sharks and why sharks make sense. Um, and then on Friday of this week, um, we are talking to oil response, oil spill response scientists um, who worked during Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico. And so we're going to hear from those folks. So. Beth and Hillary, thank you so much. Enjoy the beautiful weather in Colorado today. Thank you for joining us. And as they said, if you have any questions, just send them through us and, and we'll put you in touch with Beth or Hillary to get those answered. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming to NOAA Live. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>